Match up MS and Secretary of State for the Home Department. My Lord, um, the two extra documents on your desk one is ZT Syria, which I'll come to uh, later. The other case is a case called Sturgeon from the European Court of Justice, which we've brought to answer your Lordship's question about what guidance from the CJEU to match that of Bollinger. Now, obviously, Bollinger rather, it doesn't match Bollinger completely because that was a view, it was really guidance being given for common lawyers who weren't familiar with those concepts. But I would like to draw your attention to paragraphs 40 uh, onwards of that judgment. Um, this was in the context of compensation, a regulation for compensation for passengers whose flights had been cancelled or delayed. And at 40, there is a contrast drawn between a, an article of the regulation which provides clearly a right of compensation in the event of cancellation. So this is, this is Sturgeon? Sturgeon, yes. And we're at 40. 40 of the judgment. So and the impact of the principle in equal treatment. No, that's the uh, uh, Advocate General. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Yes, 40, yes. Thank you. And so the context was there was one part of the regulation that expressly provided for the right of compensation in the event of cancellation. By contrast, it does not expressly follow from the wording of the regulation that passengers whose flights are delayed have such a right. Uh, nevertheless, as the Court of Justice has made clear in its case law, it is necessary in interpreting a provision of community law to consider not only its wording, but also the context in which it occurs and the objectives pursued by the rules of which it is a part. And then there is reference to those cases. Uh, at 42, the operative part of a community act is indissociably linked to the statement of reasons for it, so that when it is to be interpreted, uh, account must be taken of the reasons which led to its adoption. There's reference then, 43, to those reasons. At 44, this is implicitly borne out by the objective of the regulation, since it's apparent from the recitals uh, that there, a high level of protection for air passengers was to be provided regardless of whether uh, they are denied boarding or whether their flight is cancelled or delayed, since they are all caused similar serious trouble and inconvenience connected with air transport. Over the page, further um, reference at 47 uh, to the um, general principle of interpretation that a community act must be interpreted as far as possible in such a way as not to affect its validity. Uh, likewise, where a provision of community law is open to several interpretations, preference must be given to that interpretation which ensures that the provision retains its effectiveness. And then at 48, uh, in that regard, all community acts must be interpreted in accordance with primary law as a whole, including the principle of equal treatment, which requires that comparable situations must not be treated differently and that different situations must not be treated in the same way unless such treatment is objectively justified. So, what relevance has 48? I'm going to explain that because when we come on to look at how the Advocate General dealt with. Um, some of the arguments that were being made in Geselbash and in Mengistarp as to why uh, there might be limits on the right of appeal. One of the points she made there, and you'll see the relevance of it when we come to it, is that it would be arbitrary to restrict it uh, in the way suggested because it would mean that some people had a right, uh, a remedy, and others did not. Now, that was why the broad remedy was granted, and you'll see that we have also submitted in our, in our case, and thus this is what the tribunal accepted, that it would be arbitrary and unwarranted to uh, grant a, uh, an effective remedy to those who were seeking to resist transfer based on Articles 12 to 14 of the regulation and not 
to grant an effective remedy to those seeking to challenge refusals of transfer based on fundamental rights in 8 to 11. So that's where that um, comes in, and we'll see how it, how it works in Gezelbash and Mangostar. Now, before I come to those authorities, could I just uh, turn very quickly back to the Dublin 3 regulation at tab 1? Just, just, yes. just before you carry on, could I just raise two, two questions, yes. one, one of which is substantially more difficult than the, than the other. Um, first, can you just confirm from my note, that, uh, I know that um, when MS came to this country, uh, there was a, um, a DNA test that showed that he was M AS, his brother. Yes. Uh, did he, did he then apply for asylum and, and sorry, did, did the application for asylum then succeed? Yes. Right. Um, that's the easy question. The, the second question really is just to, to make sure I understand um, the, the, the nature and scope of your argument uh, that you made yesterday. Uh, yesterday you sort of set Article 27 to one side for a moment. Yes. And focused on, uh, as it were, domestic procedures and remedies. Uh, and, and said that um, the upper tribunal uh, found the three decisions unlawful. I've looked back and they found them unlawful, um, uh, uh, pr primarily on grounds that the, um, the, ob ob the investigator obligation was not um, uh, complied with, uh, but also that, particularly in the third decision, uh, that the um, Secretary of State had failed to take into account quite a bit of evidence which suggested they were brothers. Yes. But in, in any event, all found unlawful. And then you say they go on to discuss remedies, and, and it, 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 it's under that umbrella that they um, uh, determined that they c could find they were brothers and did find that they were brothers. Y y yesterday, my understanding of your submission was that that was simply a, a, a matter of a general public law remedies here. Uh, and you mentioned cases like Balajigari, in, in which that's been held. But in Balajigari, and I think the other cases, uh, w one important uh, element was the fact that um, Article 8 was in play. Yes. So I I is your, um, w was that uh, submission uh, general for all JRs, or was the fact that Article 8 was in play in this case um, uh, particularly uh, important? Yes. Um, and if, if, that's, if that's right... How does that fit with um, Miss Giovanetti's submission that um, D Dublin, Ar Article 8, um, is, is still there behind Dublin, uh, but Dublin really occupies the whole of the ground except these tiny circumstances? And she, she referred to three, to, to three phrases of sort of exceptionality where um, it, it, Article 8 may still have some scope, but generally speaking, you, you, you look at Dublin 3, and uh, only Dublin 3, that, that occupies the Article 8 uh, space. So, I mean, I've looked back at the, the, the pleadings in this case, and, and this was pleaded as a, a separate Article 8 claim. Yes. Um, but but, but how, how does that fit in with Ms Giovanetti's um, submission? The answer to that um, is partly uh, an analysis of ZT Syria, which I, will, I was planning to come to later. But let me explain how this has arisen and how this arises in these cases that come regularly before the tribunal, uh, challenging refusals of take charge requests um, for breach of Dublin 3. The um, argument is that the breach of Dublin 3 is an interference with the right under the Charter which is a, an overarching right, Article 7. It's, it's subsumed, it's, or, or it's not even that it's subsumed in, in Dublin 3. It, it runs through it. That's what we saw from the recitals, and I'll come to how that works in the interpretive exercise. But alongside that, there is, a, a, in taking a decision, a duty on a public authority in the UK to act compatibly with Article 8, and if the decision is unlawful under Dublin 3, then that public authority will not have acted in accordance with the law and will be unable to justify the interference as proportionate. Now, ZT Syria, as I explained yesterday, concerns a completely different 
situation. It is addressing a situation where Dublin 3 has not been invoked, where there is no decision making under a domestic procedure and what the applicants sought to do because they said that Dublin 3 was not working in France was to invoke a decision outside the ordinary processes and obtain a mandatory order for admission. That is where the exceptionality test came in. What that case, those cases do not do is say that once you are in a domestic law procedure of any type, whether it's entry clearance, whether it's Dublin 3, that there is no duty on the Secretary of State to act in the ordinary way, lawfully, when taking decisions which indisputably interfere with the right to family life. I had understood you initially to be saying there's a perfectly good domestic procedure here, which is followed in this case a judicial review, applying ordinary judicial review principles. Uh, and in view of the concession that's been made on ground two, there's no point, no need to go any further. Yes. Uh, that, that's a very important point because the Court of Appeal, irrespective of all these points about whether you can have a reference to European academic case or not, the Court of Appeal doesn't normally deal with academic issues unless there are various criteria that are satisfied. Um, and on that approach, we might we might, have, might decide or could decide uh, not to reach a conclusion, a final conclusion, on the Article 27 point. Um, now, and when, I, when, I, when we were investigating with you what the grounds for the judicial review decision was, you said it was unlawfulness. But I thought, that, I mean, I hadn't gone back to the piece, I hadn't realised that that was inextricably mixed up with an Article 8 point, because of course yes. any, any or local or any, any public body has an obligation to carry out a due process, I suppose, to make of investigations, etc., to act rationally. And I thought it was on those ordinary principles that we were talking about. But as I understand from your responses to my law, the judicial review was inextricably mixed up with, um, as it were, what I would describe as wider uh, human rights issues under Article 8. Yes. So those were essential to the judicial review, were they? Well, they were, they were part of the judicial review because it was said that it was an unlawful interference with Article 8 slash Article 7. I mean, we, we can have a look at the claim form, which is um, at tab 17 of the court bundle. I mean, the failure, the failure to, so the point I'm, I'm trying to make is the failure to consider evidence necessary for making a decision would, I suppose, be challengeable on ordinary judicial review grounds yes. without reference to Article 8. That's right, but what was being said here was, in addition, that Article 8 was engaged and it wasn't disputed that there was... I mean, we can go and have a look at um, the, the, the d grounds of defence, we can look at the, uh, at the judgment, we can look at the... It's possible it, it, to look at the judgment. Yes. Because the tribunal <coughs> points out that uh, these specific specificity of the challenge has evolved over time. And by the time it was before the tribunal, it set out in paragraphs 40 and 46 under three headings. That's really where we should be looking at. Well, the, the, um, if you look at paragraph 43, you can see the, well, it, under the heading, it, what, so if, if we're in tab 8, which is where the judgment is, <coughs> the applicant's case is summarised. Which paragraph? Paragraph 40 starts, and then 43, you'll see procedural first, obligations. First is 42. Yes. Right. In support of that, so 
In reaching all three decisions, the respondent failed to comply with his obligation to take steps to investigate and or facilitate with the French authorities the carrying out of DNA testing on MS in France, um, or failing to consider whether to admit him. Uh, then, in support of that obligation, Ms Kilroy relies on the terms of Dublin 3 regulation itself, and so on and so forth, and you'll see the procedural obligations imposed by Article 7 and Article 8 of the ECHR, which march alongside each other, because we're in Dublin 3, the, the space is occupied by EU law, um, and therefore, um, in, as we'll see from the Charter, any decision taken um, under a EU law uh, has to comply with the rights in the Charter, uh, and then the common law duty to act fairly. Then at 44, failed uh, to investigate uh, adequately whether a DNA test should be carried out. Then secondly, I mean, this is a summary of the argument. Obviously, I rely on how it was put in the claim form, but this is just to show that all these issues were live. Secondly, Ms. Kilroy contends the evidence before the respondent prior to each decision was such that in any event it was irrational to conclude MS and MAS were not <coughs> related as they claimed. And then you'll see at 46, there's the arguments which is before your lordships, because all those previous arguments are not before your lordships, because those were the ones that led to the quashing of the decision. Uh, but here it's Article 27, and you can see um, the, the reference to cases which are um, Human Rights Act or Article 8 cases, Belfast City Council and misbehaving. That, so I mean, that, that's right, isn't it? I mean, th 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 this is a, obviously a shorthand for the, for the yes. arguments, but um, up, up to the word further, about five lines from the end, that's, we're on about Article 27. But yes. where it's got further, she submits that it was a, um, whether their brothers were present in fact, that's back, that's back on to judicial review. That's back on to yes. straightforward... Judicial review, stroke yes. Article Eight, but, but domestic remedies. Yes. And and and, and that's um, uh, how it was pleaded in paragraph two point three point five of the um, uh, statement of grounds. Yes, and then there was a skeleton argument in which all those arguments were set out for the hearing, and that's how it was always advanced on the basis that taking Article Twenty Seven together with all the domestic case law, um, there was a duty to investigate the facts and reach conclusions upon them. Um, and the domestic case law, when I say domestic case law on Article 8. So that is why I say now that the position on the investigation of facts um, in an Article 8 case has been put beyond doubt um, by Bala Jigari, um, drawing together the threads of the other cases, um, that the Malena Friend's concession that that, that uh, means that ground two, there's, there's nothing wrong with the tribunal's reasoning on ground two, uh, means that we, don't, we didn't need Article 27 to establish that uh, the tribunal needed to assess for itself whether Article 8 was engaged um, because uh, and breached uh, because the two were related, MS and MAS. So just pausing there, I'm sorry to be a little bit, little bit silly about this, but just pausing there, and I want to just disengage the, the question under paragraph 46 from the rest yes. of which, as you say, is in force. So, um, and I haven't gone back through the judgment again. I have read it once, well, a couple of times. But I haven't gone back uh, overnight to look at it again. So, you, the upper tribunal upheld the challenge, which was on the basis that combining Article 8 with ordinary judicial review principles, the decisions reached were unlawful. There's no appeal against that. There's no right of appeal. And so there we have it. Um, you say uh, it's been decided that it's perfectly all right to combine Article 8 in this general sense with um, judicial review to reach decisions about how somebody should, how the Secretary of State should go about investigating and weighing up decisions under. Dublin 3. Yes. That's what you say. Yes, because they, once you're in a process which has been set up for the express purpose of complying with fundamental rights under the Charter slash um, Article 8, then plainly you have to look at whether uh, those decisions are compliant 
um, you with... Can, you say this has nothing to do with the restriction on uh, an independent Article 8 right uh, to uh, circumvent, circumventing yes. uh, the processes under Dublin 3. There's nothing to do with it at all. This is looking at the application of uh, uh, Dublin 3, which involves necessarily a consideration of Article 8 obligations. Well, one, there are two things that it may be worth me doing now. I was just about to take you to a part of the recital that you didn't see yesterday, which confirms that this is what courts are supposed to be doing and public authorities when they apply Dublin 3. It's, it's recital 39 of Dublin 3. My Lords, you saw, your Lordship saw yesterday the specific recitals that deal with best interests of the child, uh, the, the duty to make the right to family life a primary consideration. That was at 13, 14, um, 16 and 17. But 39 draws it all together. This regulation respects the fundamental rights and observes the principles which are acknowledged, in particular in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, in particular, this regulation seeks to ensure full observance of the right to asylum guaranteed by Article 18 of the Charter, as well as the rights recognised under Articles 1, 4, 4 is um, the equivalent to Article 3, 7 is the equivalent to Article 8, 24 is the equivalent to Article 3 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and 47 is the right to an effective remedy. And then it says, this regulation should therefore be applied accordingly. So, in assessing the lawfulness of any act taken uh, under Dublin 3, it is necessary to examine uh, and, uh, whether it is compliant with those overarching duties under the Charter. And if I could now turn to the Charter uh, itself, which is at tab 4. Uh, your Lordships will see just for your note, Article 7 is at page 326, Respect for Private and Family Life. So, Respect for, this is at, at um, 326 of 397. Oh, sorry. Article 7. Yeah, on the top, uh, the side of the Top right hand corner, you'll see C326 to 397. They're all 326. Oh. Uh, then it's 397 is the, is the, is the right number, yeah. sorry. 397, Article 7. And then at 405, the right to an effective remedy and to a fair trial. And um, I, I, the, the, the relevant uh, part of this is everyone whose rights and freedoms guaranteed by the law of the union are violated has the right to an effective remedy before a tribunal in compliance with the conditions laid down in this article. And that's going to become important in, uh, when we look at um, Gesselbash. Uh, article 51 over the page. The provisions of this charter are addressed to the institutions, bodies, offices and agencies of the Union with due regard for the principle of subsidiarity and to the member states only when they are implementing Union law. Now obviously when you are applying Dublin 3, you are implementing Union law, so you have to comply with the Charter. Uh, they shall therefore respect the rights, observe the principles and promote the application thereof in accordance with their respective powers and respecting the limits of the powers of the Union as conferred on it uh, by the, in the treaties. So it is absolutely clear that when you are operating under Dublin 3 as a public authority, 
as a member state, you must comply with these rights. And obviously, in, ha in anyone who is exercising a remedy against that uh, must be able to rely on breach of those rights. Now, similarly, when one is in operating in the domestic law context, you bring a, a judicial review challenge, you, uh, uh, you challenge the decision as unlawful under domestic law principles, uh, EU law, which is part of the public law um, that needs to be applied, and if it engages uh, the um, Human Rights Act, uh, under those rights, under the Human Rights Act, there's nothing to exclude it. Uh, now, and it may be now that we should have a look at ZT Siri, just so that your lordships can see how narrow uh, and specific the issue that arose in, in that case was, because... I'm sorry, it, it, yes. lo lo looking at Article 27, yes. which is headed remedies, so we know, we know, as it were, where we are, we're talking about remedies, what comes to things on sort of um, breach. Um, is another way of putting your submission this, um, that uh, given that Dublin 3 was intended to uh, extend the rights of individuals in all sorts of ways, um, it would be at least surprising if Article 27 cut down uh, on the domestic remedies available in a particular member state. Well, well, that is one way of putting it, but I would put it further than that. It's, it's not possible for... Um, no, Article 27 no, 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 to, to cut down a domestic law no. remedy. It's, it, re remembering, of course, that the regulation is a piece of secondary legislation at, um, e in the EU legislative context. And Article 47 is the overarching right which Article 27 is seeking to comply with. And it is one of the submissions that I'll be making when we come on to look at what was said in Gesselbash about the aims and intentions of Dublin 3 is that it's plain that one must, once you have rights, which you do under Dublin 3, under the relevant family reunification provisions, once you have rights, you must have an effective remedy when those rights are not complied with. So even if Article 27 did not apply, Article 47 would. So what would be even odder, in my submission, is to interpret Article 27, so as to exclude these types of decisions in circumstances where Article 47 must cover them. I'll come on to explain that in due course. But we in this I'm sorry, I understand that, but that, 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 that's not looking at remedies. Um, just, just looking at remedies, um, and Article 27 only concerns remedies. Um, as I say, it would at least be strange, it seems to me, um, if um, Article 27 was intended to cut down on whatever domestic remedies were available in whatever member state. Well, well it would. And, and in my submission, that is not a, the pleaded case that has been made here. I mean, one of the, 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 the points that I made yesterday um, is that we have said very clearly in our skeleton argument that the Secretary of State has failed to identify in their, in their appeal that the scope of the challenge is very narrow in this jurisdiction because the judicial review rights uh, are available anyway. Um, and one of the surprising things that my learned friend said yesterday was that uh, Article 27 not applying would mean that individuals would have to stay in France after receiving a refusal of a take charge request, make their asylum claim there, and then make an entry clearance application. Well, as my learned friend knows, that is not what happens in practice. Uh, there are many cases in the tribunal as we speak all of which are addressing refusals of take charge requests where there has been no transfer and in respect of which remedies are granted or not granted on the facts. Uh, and indeed, there is one case currently before the Court of Appeal. I think my Lord, Lord Justice Higginbottom has ordered it in on an oral permission hearing. That is all about um, a refusal of a take charge request and whether that refusal was compatible with Article 9 of the regulation. Um, it, no one has ever suggested that those judicial reviews uh, were not governed, uh, uh, sorry, were not possible because Article 27 uh, did not um, uh, cover uh, refusals of take charge requests. So this is a this is this issue. If, if it is said now 
that Article 27 does, in fact, intend to cut down domestic law rights. That is not pleaded. It's not before you. <laughs> I understand that. Yes. I understand the point about rights. I, yes. I, I do understand that. But this isn't the, the point I made. It's not about rights. Yes, it's about I, remedies. Just, remedies, yes. Uh, uh, because um, leaving your rights argument aside, we, we, we've got to hear that on Article 27, the scope of Article 27. But leaving that aside, just looking at remedies, which Article 27 is about, yes. um, we have our domestic remedies. Uh, the, the idea behind Article 27 is to ensure that member states do have remedies, one way or another, uh, which are effective. Your submission is, we already ha we ha already ha in this yes. case, we already have yes. an effective remedy. My Lord, so, I think I may have misunderstood the, the point you were putting to it's, me. It's I, a remedies point, yes. not, a, not a rights point. Not a right to a remedy. You mean it's, it's what the scope of the remedy is in this jurisdiction. Yes. I, under yes. I understand. I, I, I misunderstood. But I, 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 think that, I, yes. I think that's right, isn't it? Yes, so ground two having been conceded, um, that this exists anyway, a domestic law, this right, or sorry, this, this, this remedy. Remedy. Um, that's, uh, it. that's it. That's I mean, it. That is the point I made yesterday. Yes, yes. That's it because um, no one is suggesting in this appeal, and it would be impossible to make that submission now with the number of judicial reviews that have been advanced in the tribunal since 2016 on refusals of take charge requests, and in any event, for the reasons I'm going to explain in Geselbash, no one is suggesting there is no right to judicially review in cases where there have been refusals of take charge requests, nor has it been suggested in those cases that Article 8 is not engaged, um, and that an Article 8... Were invited, I think, to say that Article 8 can't subsist outside. Well, um, that's not part of the, of the pleaded case in, 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 in pleaded here. Pleaded case in defence. Def it, well, it's not part of the defence. It's not part of the appeal. The appeal is very is, is very specific on the grounds of appeal, and this ZT Syria and RSM point that was raised yesterday was in response to an, a question that your lordships put about what will happen if my learned friend is right. This is all assuming that there wasn't a right of judicial review, which we've now established there is. What would happen if um, the Article 27 right remedy and right to a remedy did not cover um, transfer, uh, refusals of transfer? What would happen? The answer to that question was, well, there is this other option, and I'll come to whether that works in practice, this other option of um, in exceptional circumstances arriving. Um, so, so, so that, that, that's, that's it. So I understood uh, Ms. Jennifer case to be that if Article 27 uh, could not be properly interpreted as extending to providing a remedy where there was a refusal to take charge, then uh, the only basis for a challenge would be Article 8 in those exceptional circumstances. But So we've now opened up, or you've opened up, um, um, uh, a, 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 as it were, a completely different uh, approach to this by saying, yes, but the, the judicial review exists outside Article 27. So, the, I mean, the argument is, 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 with respect, a bad one because it, it's wholly unnecessary to go there because there, is a, there are judicial reviews um, currently afoot uh, and there were, was one in this case. Wasn't this conceded for the uh, paragraph 15? Um, the was put in terms of restricted, restricted to reviewing the legality of the decision to reject the TCR. Aside what's meant by restricted, but that seems to be yes, yes. Well, it was. I mean, this has never been, been an issue, even if your lordships look at the grounds of appeal that were rejected in this well, case. We don't need to take the matter any further. They, they, well, you, you don't, my lord, because what well, the grounds of appeal that were rejected in this case, permission for which was refused, were all on the assumption that it was. That the, the tribunal was reviewing the legality by reference to breach of Dublin 3. And my, my Lord, Lord Justice Higginbottom has read those parts of the judgment. It, the, that part of the judgment applied principles from Dublin 3, from the common law, and from Article 8. And those, as I said when I started off yesterday, the decisions were quashed. There is no appeal in relation to that. And so that can't be opened up in front of this court now. We are looking 
at this very narrow issue, which has now become completely academic because of, on the facts of this case, because of the concession on ground two, it was academic, as I said, between the parties anyway, on this very narrow issue, it's not open to the Secretary of State now to say, well, actually, the tribunal shouldn't have been looking at the lawfulness of the other decisions at all. It's just not before you. And so this whole um, ZT Syria and RSM argument is, with respect, it's a complete red herring, as well as not being pleaded. Um, but I, will, I think what I would like to do, because it's clearly troubling your lordships, is to look at ZT Syria, just to show your lordships quickly how narrow the issue was there. And RSM was applying ZT Syria with a slight modification, as I will explain. And then, if I may, I will come on to Gezelbash and Mengistan. Now, the longest part of my submissions is going to be on Gezel, Bash and Mengistab. The other cases I'll be able to take very shortly. And having dealt with this point and with um, ZT, Syria and RSM, that will be really the end of my submissions, unless there are any questions that my lords have. So I hope that I will be able to... So, so ZT, Syria has just handed up. Another indication it wasn't, I hate to keep on referring to it, but it wasn't even in the bundle because this point was not, was not raised. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've, I've mislaid my ZT Siri. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, at um, paragraphs three, well, I think... Should we look at the facts or not? Uh, you can, well, yes. Um, the, the... It might be worth reading the head note. Should we just do that? Yes. Okay. This was a fairly typical case of an asylum seeker in France not under any circumstances wanting to claim asylum in France. Well, at the time, I mean, your Lordship will remember this problem from Citizens UK. At the time, um, uh, and query whether it still continues, there were problems with accessing that procedure. Whatever the reasons were, uh, children were not uh, accessing the procedure, and this was a, uh, a method um, of uh, uh, avoiding those problems and so it was a very narrow and specific process outside Dublin 3 altogether and that was the whole point of it and if we then look at paragraph 3 of Lord Justice Beetson's judgment you'll see is described there, none of the first four claimants applied for asylum in France, where they were at the material time. The claimants maintain the UK as a member state responsible for examining their application, so they were relying on Dublin, but they hadn't claimed asylum in, in France. However, before their arrival in the UK on the 21st of January, first four claimants had made no formal application to the UK authorities for asylum or leave to enter. Their requests were contained in letters before claim, and then proceedings were issued. Now, there was then um, a description of the Dublin 3 regulation, and the question before this court uh, concerns the relationship of its procedures and process with processes with the right to respect for private and family life. In what circumstances, this was the question before the court, can the processes and procedures of the Dublin 3 regulation for determining the member state responsible for 
processing an application for asylum be bypassed because of the rights under the European Convention? When, if at all, can an individual who's not in the UK decide not to apply for asylum in the first member state uh, that he or she enters and ask another member state directly that it take charge of his asylum application and either directly or through a family member require that other family member to consider an application or um, admit him or her? Now, this is where we then see this point about coexisting. <coughs> uh, the point about that, uh, and I'll, I'll explain how it... Um, operates here. This is that Article Dublin 3 does not prevent you from relying on Article 8 outside Dublin 3. That's the point <coughs> that's being made there. So that's the coexist point. But he then argued, Mr EDQC, that since the Dublin procedures are premised on the importance of children's rights, it should not be possible to bypass the procedural mechanism at the <coughs> initial stage uh, for determining which member state is responsible. He accepted that despite the principle of mutual confidence between member states that fundamental rights will be observed in all member states, there is an exception. The exception is where an applicant can show that the legal system of the member state in which the individual is present will not <coughs> react to the claim and cannot be expected to act in accordance with the Dublin processes, including their reflection of the importance of family life. And then the claimant's position, on the other hand, is that the Dublin III process in France failed to vindicate and protect their rights uh, under the European Convention, they also maintain that in any event they have a freestanding right to enter under Article 8 and that as a result the UK was under a positive uh, substantive duty to admit. And then you see that it had become um, effectively academic by the time of the hearing and uh, the purpose of the appeal um, was explained. And then at paragraphs 8 and 9 is a summary of the conclusion. Should we just read those to ourselves? Yes, please. So, obviously, the point there at the end of paragraph 8, an application for entry by an unaccompanied minor without first invoking the appropriate Dublin III procedures in the relevant member state can only be justified in an especially compelling case. That's the ratio of, that, of this judgment. And we're not in that territory. We are, in a, we are not in the territory of either not invoking Dublin III or complaining in a UK court about... Uh, defects in the French system. We are here in a completely conventional manner, having properly and correctly used the Dublin III system, having established that the Secretary of State has acted unlawfully or having good arguments, depending on which way you, which, which end you're looking at it, and saying that that is an interference because this is a, all about reunification of family members, it is plainly, and it engages Article 8, it's an interference, it can't be justified because the UK's conduct is unlawful under Dublin 3. Not in accordance with the law, and disproportionate. Now, there's nothing at all in ZT Syria to touch on those arguments. And there's no bypassing. And if we go on to have a look at some of the reasoning, uh, you'll see that the grounds of appeal at paragraph 57, that's on page 4915, this was the Secretary of State's grounds of appeal. First, uh, two limbs. The first is that the, well, may I just ask your lordships to read it rather than. Again, it's all about the absence of. 
Dublin 3 and the need to in invoke Dublin 3. Um, uh, then it, at 58E, this is important because the, one of the complaints that was made is that the tribunal failed to consider the obligations imposed on France as a result of Article 8 and the access to redress available to those in France for any breach by France of those obligations. So the suggestion, that the problem that was being raised was the breach of Article 3 and Article 8 in relation to the failure to comply with Dublin was France's breach and should be pleaded in a French court. Now, that's a very long way from that to say that a breach of Dublin 3 by the UK should be pleaded in a French... I mean, how is this even supposed to work, should be pleaded in a French court? It's... It, it's with respect, it's, it's not a good argument. Um, and we then turn on to... Um, the, ar the argument at 59 that was ultimately accepted, um, only in an exceptionally compelling case uh, that Article 8 can prevail. So in other words, you haven't used Dublin, but you um, can use Article 8 instead. And there is reference that was there. Submission. That was his submission. That was his submission. Why don't we, we don't use it. Why can't we just go... And then we go to... 86, and again, if I could just ask you to, to read 86 and see again the reference to trumping Dublin, the Dublin process. court then examined at 87 onwards what the test should be, what the threshold should be for trumping. You can see at 88 that one of the problems that the court was concerned about was assessing defects in the French system. And then at 95, well, sorry, what, what, I, before we get to 95, if we could, so 92 is really the, 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 the threshold issue. I consider that the tribunal set too low a hurdle uh, for permitting that process to be displaced by Article 8 considerations. And he, goes, he goes for the especially, especially compelling case. That's where the especially compelling... That's where he, he approved that. Yes. And then at 95, um, I consider that applications such as the ones made by these claimants, very specific to the what was going on in this case. That's all this judgment is addressing. It has no wider uh, significance. Should only be made in very exceptional circumstances where they can show that the system of the member state they do not wish to use... In this case, the French system is not capable of responding adequately to their needs. And then there is an expl explanation of what they would be expected to do. Um, things in France. Uh, and it's at the end of that paragraph, only after it's demonstrated there's no effective way of proceeding in that jurisdiction should they turn to the authorities and the courts in the United Kingdom. Now, you can see why the court reached that view. French, there was an issue with the French courts. They... they felt it was necessary that you should demonstrate that, that in the French courts um, uh, and try to fit seat the remedy in the French courts before you come to the UK. Um, and then um, the final uh, conclusion at 100. Any future application, this is talking about how, I, I should emphasise that the court didn't say that it was wrongly done in this case on the facts. They just said that the tribunal had applied the wrong test. You saw that from paragraph 9 of the judgment. So it, this option is open, and I think that's one of the points that my learned friend is making. It is open. It's just there's a high threshold. Um, any future application at 100 will be considered against that very different, that different evidential background because it looked as if the circumstances had improved. But the general import of the recent evidence suggests that save in a case such as that of the Syrian baby, a claim completely bypassing the initial procedural stage and the way that occurred in these proceedings is unlikely to meet the required threshold of an especially compelling case. 
So it applies to um, certain situations where there's been a breach of Article 21 and submitting a take charge request, but not to replying to a take charge request under Article 22. Well, it, it applies to a situation where uh, an individual has um, a, a case that they have tried not to. It's not, it's not supposed to be about the Dublin process at all. An individual has a case that they haven't been able to use the Dublin 3 system for whatever reason in the country, and it may be, it could be, I suppose, a, a, a failure to make a take charge request, exactly, um, and unable to, uh, to use remedies in that country for some but reason. In any event, you say it doesn't apply to but it doesn't apply process. to this situation where the responsibility has shifted because the take charge request has been made. Uh, it's been made to the United Kingdom. It's all under the Dublin 3 process. No one has bypassed anything, at least not on the, not, none of the applicants have bypassed anything. Uh, the UK's responsibility is now engaged to answer the take charge request, and they've done so unlawfully. But I think the answer to my question is more or less yes. It is more or less yes. It, you could use it. That's not how it was used here. But you could use it in that situation, I suppose. But you would be more likely to uh, be, be challenging the Article 21 decision in the, UK, in the French court. Um, so that's um, now RSM. Was a slight variation on that theme. It's at tab 41 of the bundle. And um, uh, the what the court um, addressed there was again uh, an order, an application had been made to the United Kingdom directly because of delays in Italy. And the tribunal had applied the ZT Syria test, or had purported to apply it, had tried to apply it, and the court found that it had wrongly applied it. And you can see that, um, there were, but there were two, one of the confusions about ZT um, RSM is there were two issues. One was article, whether that um, request under Article 17, fell within Article 17 of Dublin 3. If it did, that's a sovereignty clause, then the whole thing would have been within Dublin 3. So that was why that issue was important. The court rejected the argument that you could make a, an application for asylum directly to the United Kingdom relying on the sovereignty clause, and that's the first part of the judgment. And the second part of the judgment, which is given less reasoning, uh, uh, is that the court also erred, the tribunal also erred, in making the order under Article 8. The variation in that case was that by the time, uh, was that this, in that case, the applicant had made an asylum application in Italy. And the delays had occurred after that asylum application was made. And so the tribunal had said, well, that's a difference with ZT Syria because this individual has tried to engage with the system. And so the threshold is lower. And the court said, no, it, the threshold is not lower. You're still bypassing because you're writing directly to the UK. And therefore, the threshold uh, is the same and the that the, um, the uh, take charge request, um, uh, uh, sorry, and the threshold was the same, and that, the, uh, th that, that it wasn't met in this case. Now, you can see those conclusions at 142 to 143. This is Lady Justice Arden.
this case did not meet the high hurdle in ZT Syria. 142. 142. At 5525 of the transcript. So in my judgment, sorry, just to show the structure of the judgment, you'll see issue three on the page before Article 8. This is at 5523. And then at 142, in my judgment, Ms. Giovanetti is correct to focus on the Italian processes. I agree with her. There's no evidence that there was unacceptable delay in dealing with RSM's case. Um, once it was established, he was an unaccompanied child. The process moved forward by stages. The Italian court, uh, which, which took place in a reasonably timely fashion, the Italian court appointed a guardian. This case did not meet the high hurdle in ZT Syria. And that's really... And then there are comments about, this is what my learned friend was referring to, about the risks of prioritising, you see this at the end of that page, one child over another. But that, of course, is in the context of uh, bypassing and saying to the United Kingdom, well, the Italians have not got on with it, so you need to take charge now. And I'm going to ask you directly. Now, at that stage, the take, no ch take charge request had been made by Italy after the order was made by the tribunal, a take charge request was made. So just so there's no confusion about that if your lordships are reading the judgment. But it, the, this really goes to, I think, uh, the, the point made by my, my lord, uh, uh, Lord Justice Simon, which is that this was about a failure in Italy to make a take charge request. It's not about a failure in the UK to act lawfully under Dublin 3. And so these and judgments there, have not... what she says at the end of 143 is um, basically you have to trust the Italian authorities unless it's been shown that the system is not operating effectively. So in that case, they came to the conclusion the system was operating effectively. Yes. And that was... So that's all very much within the ZT Syria bracket. Now, my learned friend also took you to um, paragraph 173 of Lord Justice Singh's judgment. Now, Lord Justice Singh's judgment is a follow-on judgment. I think it's fair to say it's a short judgment. Uh, and he, what he says is, at 173, is turning to issue three, in my, which is the Article 8 issue. In my view, the upper tribunal misdirected itself in, in law when seeking to apply the test, which had been laid down by this court in ZT Syria. As this court made clear in that passage, recourse to Article 8 in the context of the Dublin system will only be possible in very exceptional circumstances. Now, my Lord, I, I think my learned friend may have come close to trying to suggest that that meant you could never rely on Article 8 in a Dublin 3 case, except in exceptional circumstances. Now, that cannot possibly be right. That is not the ratio of ZT Syria, which um, Lord Justice Singh is relying on. The context of the Dublin system means you should be using Dublin, but you're not. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you are using Dublin as intended and you're not allowed to rely on Article 8. That can't be what that yes, passage means. It's fair means. to say that 173, if read on its own, yes. the context is a little misleading. Yes, and that is why it's so important that parts of judgments are not relied on without a full understanding and explanation of how they relate to the to the um, ratios that are uh, being that, that are upon which they depend <coughs> these cases are about circumventing and bypassing in circumstances where the conduct that is giving rise to the um, original problem is in another member state. They cannot possibly be said to provide any guidance on what a court should do in assessing the lawfulness of conduct in the UK under Dublin 3. So, I mean, what it sh what, uh, more accurately, perhaps, the sentence <coughs> beginning in paragraph 173, as this court made clear in that passage, recourse to Article 18 in the context of the Dublin system will only be possible, uh, you would have, as, as this court made clear in that passage, uh, recourse to Article 8 to bypass 
the Dublin system. Yes. Possible. That's how you would read that. Well, that, that, that must be what is meant there, because there is nothing in ZT Syria, which is what he says he's <coughs> applying, to say that you can't rely on Article 8 once you, when you're within Dublin 3. It's not, that's not what it was about. So that's our SM. Um, now, could I now come back, please, to Gezelbash and the Article 27 issue? Now, having got this far with your propositions on the domestic law uh, here, combined with Article 8, what is it you now want to get out of this case? Well, my Lord, we have set out in our skeleton argument what we said the court should do, which is to summarily dismiss the appeal on the basis that it could not be fully and properly determined, fully and properly ventilated, I think is the term in... Um, Pop Dog um, and Hamnet on academic appeals because of the inability to refer it to the CJEU. Now, your Lordship has indicated yesterday that, uh, quite properly, that you wanted to hear the argument on Article 27 to see whether there was a doubt, because if there isn't a doubt, then you don't need to refer it to the CJEU, and that problem does not arise. Um, so, but I assume you'll be saying to us, I mean, you put this on the basis of the inability of the CJU to hear any um, reference. But if you were right thus far in your submissions, you could make the point simply on our own domestic approach to dealing with academic issues in the Court of Appeal. Well, I do make that. That was the point. You haven't advanced. I mean, that's a much simpler way of putting it. Yes. Which is that unless there are, there are good reasons to do so. One shouldn't deal with academic issues uh, if you don't need to. Well, I think the, th that strand of the argument was the second strand that I raised yesterday because I accepted um, uh, before the tribunal that the question of whether the tribunal could hear the issue of uh, the relation, whether the relationship was established for itself was an important issue that needed to be which resolved. Which relationship? between MS and MAS. So could it reach a factual conclusion on that? That was of practical significance in this jurisdiction um, for obvious reasons and of great practical significance in this case, although that is now academic. But um, the, the argument that I made against hearing the appeal despite that was based on the, the fact that it arose on EU law and your lordships have that point. The new factor that arose yesterday, only after I heard my learned friend's submissions, was that ground two is no longer disputed, so that that practical uh, consequence, it does not arise in this jurisdiction. Article 8 uh, is engaged in these cases. That issue is not in dispute before you. And therefore, the tribunal was entitled to decide the issue as part of its ordinary jurisdiction um, under Article 8. If, if, um, I, I know we, we, we raised this with you yesterday, um, but I'd just like to confirm y y your view. Um, the, the, the submission that um, the um, in inability to ref make a reference in this case um, it is based really on whether, uh, on the construction of Article 27, uh, it, it's at Clare. Yes. And... Um, you obviously said it's not at clear against you. Yes. Um, you, you didn't formally concede that it was not at clear for you either. I, I think you. I think to put what you said yesterday was that you may have an uphill struggle on it, but you didn't formally concede well, it. Is that fair? Uh, I, I, what I got from what you were saying was that once we'd seen all the authorities on the point, uh, you thought it was sufficiently clear. That, I think, that is what I would like to submit this morning. I would like to have the opportunity, if your Lordships, given the way things went yesterday, to show your Lordships um, Gezel, the bits of Gezelbash and Mengistar, which in my submission put this issue beyond doubt. Um, and it, it will, I, I, because of the restrictiveness of the Act Clare doctrine, ultimately I accept that this is an issue that this court will have to consider for itself, because it is, it is a matter of 
judgment whether it is so clear um, that you can be sure that the CJEU would agree with you. Um, that is a matter for judgment. I say it is that clear. When you look at the whole structure of the, ju of, of the reasoning in uh, Mengistab, which I do want to show you, and I will try to take it as quickly as possible. But, but, but are, you, are you, and I don't want to give you a point you don't want to take, but as I said, as matters have turned out, because ground three has gone on your submission, it's all dealt with under English jurisprudence, which can't be challenged, right of judicial review, allied to Article 8, in consideration the operation of Dublin 3. Yes. Uh, you say, do, I mean, are you or are you not taking the point that following all our ordinary domestic principles of Court of Appeal dealing with, or not dealing with academic um, issues, we shouldn't deal with it? Yes. You are taking that I point. do take that point. That was the point I made at the outset of my submissions yesterday. And I, one of the points I would like to make as a matter of general principle allied to that also is triggered by this late reliance on RSM and ZT Syria. One of the problems with hearing academic cases, which I know I don't need to tell this court, but the minute you start moving away from the discipline of a live case with active pleaded issues, um, it is, there, is, there are risks of considering issues which are just not raised or would, would never have come up in the context of that particular case. And I, I, so I just put that on the table as one of the potential problems. So that, but basically what we're now entering into is act clear territory. Yes. So Gezel Bash is at tab 12 of the bundle. My Lord, it, it's not um, possible to overestimate the importance of this case because what it did is establish that there had been a departure from the position that previously existed under Dublin II where the mechanism was viewed as almost entirely interstate to the position under Dublin III where the mechanism uh, was... A, a, a hybrid, effectively, of interstate and individual rights. And your Lordships will see um, the summary, which I think your Lordships were taken to yesterday, at paragraph three of the Advocate General's opinion of the Common European Asylum System, and the reference to the criteria. And then the question about whether the court's ruling in Abdullahi that the grounds of appeal or review against a transfer decision are limited in a situation where a member state agrees to take charge of an application for, um, uh, to take charge of an application for asylum, whether that still applies. And you see that at paragraph five. Now then at paragraph 10, the um, Advocate General summarises the substantive changes made to, Dub to Dublin 2 and Dublin 3 uh, with reference to the recitals. <clears throat> and I draw attention in particular uh, to the recital 5, objective criteria fair to both to the Member States and for the persons concerned. Then there's the reference to the need for speed. And then at nine, uh, there is uh, the need to uh, enhance the protection granted to applicants under that system. <coughs> and then uh, this is the reference to recital 19. And your lordships have seen the effective protection of the rights of persons should be guaranteed by providing legal safeguards and the right to an effective remedy in respect of transfer decisions. And then there is reference to the um, preamble on compliance with, this is at tab 11, at paragraph 11, with the Charter. The, the Advocate General then goes on to set out the procedural rights at paragraphs 11 to 15, 
And those include the right to information, paragraph 14, the right to a personal interview. And I, one of the points that your lordships didn't see yesterday but for your note, in Article 4, one of the rights, one of the pieces of information that member states are given under Article 4 is the ability to tell member states of where that they have family members in another member state. So it expressly refers to uh, that, that part of the regulation, the criteria on family reunification. And then at paragraph 16, there's reference to uh, the hierarchy of criteria. And at 17, the top of the hierarchy. And what, what the Advocate General then says at the bottom of paragraph 17 is, is significant. If, and this is how the way the hierarchy works, if neither of those type two criteria applies, in adult, this is in relation to adult applicants, um, family reunification, then responsibility is allocated by establishing the first state through which the applicant entered the European Union. And those are the provisions at, uh, at Article 12 onwards. Now, just pausing there, it's important to note that those are the ones that do not on their face engage fundamental rights. And yet on the respondent on, on the appellant's case, it's those ones. Sorry, the, the start, what does not engage fundamental rights? Article 12, on its face. These are the ones where you're sending people back to the country where they first entered the union because they have not shown um, that there is a family, a right to family life in some other um, member state. There is no fundamental right that they are invoking under Articles 8 to 11. That's the top of the hierarchy. And that's not to say that fundamental rights won't be engaged by the decision to transfer. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that on their face, those articles about entry without a visa or with a visa are not about respecting fundamental rights. have actually reported uh, something wrong with the air conditioning. It's obviously not been fixed. I'm very grateful, my lord. Um, so those are um, the criteria. Now then at paragraphs 33 to 34, of, again, the Advocate General's opinion, there is reference to what the referring court was asking. an explanation of the understanding of the case in Abdullahi. And then at paragraph 34, in the light of the changes introduced by the Dublin 3 regulation, the referring court wants to, sorry, strengthening judicial protection for asylum applicants, the referring court wants to know whether the amended chapter 3 criteria now constitute a ground of appeal against a transfer decision for the purposes of article 27 of that regulation. And then, my, if I could ask your lordships to read what the questions were, because it's important that uh, your lordships understand what was before the court. So question one was whether there is a broad remedy against the misapplication of the criteria. And if not, um, question two was whether there was some other uh, remedy based on the right to family life or any other circumstances. And then th three is a, mod is, is, a, is a modification of that question. Uh, what the, court, what the Advocate General then goes on to do, at 39 onwards, is make some preliminary observations about 
how the, the um, regulation is still primarily an interstate process, but there are a number of exceptions to that general rule within the legislative scheme of the regulation. Paragraph 40, the first exception, is the one relevant to us. When applying the Chapter 3 criteria, the member states must take account of the presence of an applicant's family members in the EU territory where relevant before another member state accepts a request, request to take back or take charge of the applicant. Article 7. Uh, three, C further, Article 8 concerning minors, and Articles 9 to 11 <coughs> in relation to family members. And then there are some other exceptions uh, referred to there, including the discretionary clauses, at paragraph 42, uh, 43. These exceptions indicate the scheme of Dublin 3 regulation provides some scope for taking account of an individual applicant's particular situation and views on which state should examine his asylum application. That said, none of them appears to apply to Mr. Gesselbash, and there's nothing in the order for reference indicating that he seeks to rely on them. Now, she then goes on to consider question one. And what she does there, and later on in this opinion, is set out the competing views as to how um, Article 27 should be interpreted. We don't need to get into all that. Well, you do, uh, you do, because it's really important to see what was suggested was the correct interpretation and what she ultimately concluded. So I'm afraid you do. So in particular... Um, it was Mr. Gesselbash at paragraph 545 who suggested a broad interpretation. This is the one that was ultimately adopted. But then you see at 46 that both France and the Commission uh, submit Mr. Gesselbash still does not have a right of appeal against the application of Chapter 3 criteria. In principle, it does not we matter. Read, I do want us to read large sections. Should we do that? Yes, could you read Let's paragraph 46? I apologise. I hope it's obvious that the middle part of that section, Article 27 applies only where Dublin 3 regulation confers specific substantive or procedural rights which an applicant can invoke, which in turn reflect the required protection of certain fundamental rights. And then there was the, what ends up being option one, we'll see in a moment, the Netherlands government said nothing had changed. So you then see those options uh, summarised Oh, before, before, sorry, before we look at that, could I ask you to look at paragraph 56? Because this goes back to a, a, a point that your Lordship was making yesterday uh, uh, about why there is a focus on the transfer decision where you have an acceptance of a take charge request. An applicant cannot lodge an application for appeal or review before the requesting state takes a transfer decision. The challenge, if one is made, is to the transfer decision, not to the requested member state's agreement to accept, accept responsibility as such. That is logical, as it is the transfer decision which directly affects the individual asylum applicant. So that is the point uh, about why all the, the focus is in an acceptance case is on the transfer decision. In a refusal case, it's the refusal that directly affects the individual asylum applicant. So there's then discussion of the Article 27 remedy. Then you'll see at 60 to 62, the options that we've just looked at summarised. The first option, the Netherlands one, is nothing has changed. The second option is that you get a right of appeal where Dublin 3 expressly confers rights on individual applicants which reflect substantive fundamental rights, where but only where an applicant claims that the competent authority's decision infringe one of those protected rights, he's also entitled to an appeal or review under Article 27. And then the third option is the wider right of appeal or review. So this is what I referred to yesterday when I said the pie chart. So the wider right includes option two, and we'll see how, we, how that goes, ensuring judicial review um, of the criteria on the facts presented to them. And then you'll see this is the interpretation approach. In the absence of wording indicating which of those options is correct, you have to look at the aims and context of the regulation. And there is then the reference to uh, the need to enhance judicial protection and all the recitals that we've seen. And in particular, the court, court focuses on the part of recital 19, which says um, that it's the application of the regulation that is, needs to be uh, reviewed. 
and that's the double guarantee referred to it, uh, um, at paragraph 67. And in the end, my laws, there's no substitute for reading all of this, and I will try to go as quickly as I can. But then at 68, the main reasons advanced in favour of the second option are that a narrow interpretation is more consistent with the legislative regime. So the narrow, narrow option is fundamental rights. Um, and, but she rejects it. She rejects it. She says it's not at paragraph 70. It's oversimplistic to describe Dublin III purely as an interstate uh, instrument. Why can't we go straight to 76? Yes. Well, you can. I, I'm taking you too slowly, my lord, because it... it, it, it well, we can, you can go we straight read to much of it ourselves. Yes. Yeah, but that's why I think if you focus on the essential parts, that would be helpful. But shall we go straight to 76? Yes, 76. We'll, we'll read the whole thing in our own time. She goes then more widely than, 70, uh, uh, than that, and she explains her reasoning for that in those paragraphs that follow. Yes. And then at paragraph 83, she refers again uh, to, to Article 47 of the Charter and concludes, in my view, these arguments militate in favour of endorsing the third option for interpreting Article 27. So we have at least the second option included in the third option. Um, and she, the, the, the next passage is we don't need to look at that was in relation to whether it's fact and law, what that meant. But then again, if you see at paragraph 93, she doesn't answer the, the second and third question because she says that there's no need to answer it. Should the court agree with my preference for the third option, there's no need to answer question two. However, should the court decline to follow that wider reasoning, could I ask you then to read that passage? So the third option in my submission obviously includes the right to challenge decisions under Articles 6, 8, 9 to 11. And those are, in the vast majority of cases, going to be refusals of take charge requests because that is the way that part of the regulation works. These are positive movements forward, not negative movements backwards. Now we then see um, that the court endorses uh, those conclusions, that conclusion on option one, and it explains its reasoning without referring to options one, two, and three, but you can see that that is what it is built on, and confirming uh, Applying the general scheme, this is starting at paragraph 35, its objectives and its context, that a broad remedy is required. And you'll then see at paragraph 44, the conclusion, the reference to the recital, the need uh, to ensure that the criteria are correctly applied, including the criterion for determining responsibility set out in Article 12, and that is the, the one in, that was an issue here. And then the, I said, I mentioned yesterday, they then go on to look at the general thrust. Uh, at 46, the EU legislature has introduced or enhanced various rights and mechanisms guaranteeing the involvement of asylum seekers in the process. And without going through it in detail, all of it is leading up to a conclusion that there are enhanced fundamental rights conferred on individuals in those criteria. And um, we will see in the procedural mechanisms of Dublin III, which give rise uh, to a need to, for an effective remedy. And what you then see at, at paragraph 53 
is a restrictive interpretation of the scope of the remedy provided for in Article 27 might inter alia thwart the attainment of that objective by depriving the other rights conferred on asylum seekers by that regulation of any practical effect. And of course, that would be the consequence, not here because of judicial review, but in another jurisdiction, if there was no ability to challenge those uh, decisions, it would deprive them of any, and the mandatory uh, nature of them, of any practical effect. So that's Geselbash. Now, Mengistar, which is on the ne in the next tab, sought to address whether that conclusion in relation to the application of criteria also applied to time limits. So it was an expansion of the remedy. Now, the court concluded, again, applying all of the tools of interpretation that I have already drawn attention to, and I uh, invite your lordships to read that judgment uh, in full, including the, part, uh, the parts of it at 46, um, sorry, at 42 onwards. This is in the judgment. In the judgment at 914, which echo Gezel Bash, and again reiterate that an a, strict, a restrictive interpretation of the scope of the remedy might thwart the attainment of the objectives of the regulation. Rejecting at paragraphs 56 onwards arguments advanced by the United Kingdom and the European Commission. Um, but what is important for um, today's purposes is the Advocate General's opinion because what you then see is that the European Commission returned to the theme of asking the, uh, the court to confine the remedy to the fundamental rights. And you see that um, in um, paragraphs 95 onwards. Actually, well, actually, could I start at paragraph 87? If I could ask you to, to read paragraph 87. The United Kingdom invites the court to draw a distinction between issues which give rise to substantive rights. going back to the AG's opinion. This is the AG's opinion now, 886, and paragraph 86, 87. Right. She rejects the attempt to limit it to um, substantive rights, such as a wrongful application of the Chapter 3 criteria, because she concludes that procedural matters are um, uh, substantive matters in this context of this regulation. She deals with some of the arguments advanced by the UK and the European Commission at paragraph 95. And then over the page at 103, the fourth objection is made by the European Commission alone. It asks the court to restrict the right to review or appeal under Article 27 by linking it exclusively to those provisions where the applicant's fundamental rights are at issue. If I could ask you to read without reading out at 103 to 105. So the European Commission, uh, and you can see them from the footnotes uh, at paragraph um, 41 to 42, this is on page 903, those are the footnotes to that judgment, sorry, paragraph 41 to 42 with the footnotes, which is at 903 of the, of the <coughs> judgment. Uh, sorry, of the, of the Advocate General's 41. opinion. 41. 42, 43. 41 and 40, 
two. You can see that there is a reference to the proposal that my learned friend relied on. That was the proposal that sought to limit the scope of the review in relation to transfer decisions, but um, carved out a challenge uh, in relation to uh, refusals of transfer on Article uh, 8, 9, 10 and 11 grounds. And what she says about that um, is that that limited right of review would, could rarely be pursued successfully. She observes the family criteria rarely relied on by individual applicants and the member states have proved reluctant to accept such claims. There's no suggestion at all that there's no right of review in, in relation to refusals of acceptance. It's just that it would rarely be relied on. And then you see at 42... Um, there's a reference to that explanatory memorandum. Essentially, the European Commission is proposing the solution that it advanced before the court unsuccessfully in Geselbash. So, I say that we put in a note about the reliability of Proposal 4, um, which makes some of these points, which I draw to your Lordship's attention. But the essential point is there is nothing there to suggest that the European Commission... Uh, believed, or the Advocate General believed, that decisions to refuse transfers were excluded from the current scope. On the contrary, it seems to have been the European Commission's argument that that was the basis on which Article 27 should operate. And from the passages I've shown you, that was also the Advocate General's view. And what she all, but she then what she also says is that limiting it to those articles would be arbitrary. Now, the submission that I make, going back to that principle of equal treatment that I showed you, so where did she say it would be arbitrary? at 105, 889. So the, the proposal that was made was to exclude a right of review for... Articles 12 to 15, erroneous application of the criteria, but include a right of review where there is a family tie. That's what's said at 105. And she says that would be arbitrary and unwarranted. She says it would be arbitrary, an arbitrary distinction, sorry. Because it would confer rights on some and not on others. And that's why I, I highlighted the principle of equal treatment in the Sturgeon judgment this morning earlier this morning, because what is now being suggested is even more arbitrary in the other direction. Why on earth would you, in a system which is intended to enhance individual rights, which imposes duties and gives individuals um, uh, protected rights, why would you exclude a right to an effective remedy for those parts of the regulation and give it for the parts of the regulation which on their face engage our fundamental rights less. If it's arbitrary one way, it's certainly arbitrary the other. And that was the conclusion that the tribunal drew. And my lord, when you look at all those, my lords, when you look at all those parts of the judgment and you see the emphasis on fundamental rights, you see also the, the, the right under Article 47 for an effective remedy in relation to those rights and the need to interpret Article 27 compatibly with Article 47 and without going into detail that's exactly the exercise that is performed in these judgments. In my submission it is clear that the right to challenge a refusal of a transfer is included in Article 27. It must be. Anything else would be wholly arbitrary, would make no sense, because you would still have the duty, the right to an effective remedy under Article 47, because you've got those rights under Articles 8 to 11 anyway. They're fundamental rights, enforceable at the suit of, uh, of the individual. And so you don't need Article 27 in some 
you don't need Article 27 for the fundamental right. That's in the Charter, which overrides everything. So the question is, why would you interpret Article 27 as excluding something which has to be given a remedy anyway under Article 47 of the Charter? Now, as I say, this goes back to the point in this jurisdiction, it doesn't arise because judicial review provides that effective remedy. And at least in this case, the scope of the remedy, as my Lord or Justice Hickenbottom said this morning, is sufficient. Um, now, my Lord, I don't want to, I, I, I don't have time and I don't want to go through the other cases, but Shiri um, at tab 14, for your note, 16, and we've referred to all these cases in a skeleton argument, 16, uh, 15 for Hassan, um, 16 for S, and uh, the other Hassan with two S's uh, at tab 17. They are all cases about expanding the scope of that effective remedy for breach of time limits. In Shiri, this, the decision that is capable of being challenged is not in fact the transfer decision itself directly. It is the fact that after the transfer decision was taken, a time limit had run out. And so, again, it's a further expansion beyond the transfer decision. And in my, again, my, my submission is, a, is ultimately a simple one. The, the whole course of these judgments uh, indicates in my submission without doubt, that the right to an effective remedy in relation to Articles 8 to 11, which concern refusals of take charge requests, must be included in that very first decision uh, of the uh, European Court in Geselbash, as endorsed in Mengistab, to uh, uh, adopt option three. Well, I understand what I, I suppose it might be said against you, still very interesting and very well constructed and presented, but you haven't actually explained why it might be that in a document carefully constructed, negotiated and um, drafted as Dublin 3, there is in fact no reference at all to the remedy to be provided in a case of a failure to take a request charge. Well, my Lord, the... the, the why would that well, one of the things, I, 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 my first answer to that is that that is not the correct approach to interpretation of a, um, a, of a, a, a community piece of legislation. Because what you look at is the wording, you then look at the, uh, the goals as set out in the recitals, and you, if there are gaps in the wording, and this is one of the points that was made by Lord Denning in, in Bullinger, uh, you, that, that, is, that is one of the way, one of the consequences of the type of drafting that occurs in, in um, Europe, uh, in the European, legis legisl the European legislative process. And so you look at the intention and the objectives and the general thrust rather than trying to diagnose why something may or may not have been included. So that's my first answer. My second answer is that what you see from that note to the, um, uh, the Advocate General's opinion in Mengistar, is that those parts of the regulation have been underused. The family, the the family, family rights. The family rights one, underused. Yes. And, um, for example, in this jurisdiction, there were very few take charge requests um, made to the UK in relation to family rights before ZT Syria. Syria. Effectively, ZT Syria opened um, that process in the UK because it gave an incentive to the various member states to start to um, implement processes for properly applying Dublin III family reunification. Um, so that, the fact that that was not at the foremost, that type of use of the regulation was not at the forefront of how the regulation had been used in the past may be one reason why it wasn't expressly dealt with. But what I say also is that when you look at the recital, it is quite clear that a decision regarding a transfer, there's no, there can be no dispute about that, a decision, a decision regarding a transfer is plainly capable of including um, a, refusal of a, a refusal to take charge. 
And there's, there's, there can be no argument about that in my submission. In the recital, the language of the recital, it says that you should have an effective remedy in relation to a decision regarding a transfer. Yes. And a refusal of a take charge request is unquestionably a decision regarding a transfer. Yes. There is then the distinction in Article 26 and Article 27 between, in Article 26, I accept, it says that a um, no notification must occur after an acceptance of a take charge request of a decision to transfer somebody. That's the language used. I accept that does not cover a refusal for take charge request. But that language is not used in Article 27. The language used in Article 27 is transfer decision. And transfer decision is capable of embracing both a decision regarding a transfer or a refusal of a transfer, as referred to in Recital 19, and a decision to transfer someone. As a matter of ordinary construction, it is capable of including both. And when you combine that ordinary, that, that capability of that, of that term to include both with the parts of the judgments that I have shown you, the fact that it concerns fundamental rights, in my submission, the conclusion is inexorable that it includes refusals of transfer as well as decisions you to You have mentioned something which is slightly odd, uh, not, not what, what is odd is not what you say, but an, some, an issue which is odd, which is, as you point out, Article 26.1 refers to the decision to transfer, and Article 27 refers to... Um, Transfer decision. Yes. Perhaps on the, I maybe the European drafters don't worry about inconsistencies. But in fact, the, the heading to Article 26 is notification of a transfer decision. Yeah. So the, yes. the, the wording is. Well, it is a trend. But my argument is a decision to transfer is a transfer decision, but so is a refusal of a take charge request. No, no, I was just picking up a very small point. So it's, it's not well, I think, it's wrong. I think what you, you're accepting that the expression, the decision to transfer him, doesn't include a refusal. But you said, on the other hand, that's 26. That that's said, 26. Yes, that's what I'm saying. You, you accept I it. accept 26 does not govern this. But I think what my Lord's pointing out is, curiously, 26 is headed, notification of a transfer decision. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I, I suspect it's um, slightly... Uh, slightly uh, incomplete drafting technique. Well, that, that is what um, Lord Denning was referring to, I think, in his, in his judgment. And, and the, that is where the job of the court is to look, because wording is, does not have the significance in the interpretive exercise in the EU that it does in our, own, in our own jurisdiction. And so what he was saying is common lawyers who are used to doing it in one way must exercise caution uh, when approaching I the... I don't think anything your, particularly turns yes. on that point, but it's no. just a point, it is a, it is a, a slight curiosity. Yes. We tend to be publicly somewhat more polite nowadays than Lord Denning was. Yes. Yes, well, I, 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 I understand, but I think what, what I was drawing attention to is it's a different exercise. It's a different approach. And uh, it's not just focused on wording. And my learned friends, I mean, I, there are two aspects of this argument. One is, is her position act clear? I say plainly not in the in the light of... The situations, I, the, the, the yeah, passages I've shown you. No, the only um, other parts of the authorities bundle that your lordships, um, I haven't taken you to, are those in relation to what is Act Clare and what isn't Act Clare. We'll come back to all that. Yes. Uh, I think we'll finish first of all the substantive submissions on the other parts, and then we'll rise for a few minutes and decide where we go. Um, may I just check my note? So uh, there were two um, other points that I wanted to just um, round up with. The one is that 
it's, it's really a, a, a point that was made by my learned friend that I don't think is going to go anywhere. But this argument that you could apply for entry clearance from, the U, from France instead um, and after having applied for asylum, there are a range of obstacles to transferring refugee status. I'm not going to burden this court with, with that, but it just doesn't work in the way my learned friend suggested it might. And of course, as I, th as, as, as I think the court observed yesterday, in any event, if the issue is a family relationship, then the entry clearance would be refused and there would be an appeal in this country in any event under the entry clearance process. So um, it really doesn't provide any kind of better solution uh, than that of a, of a judicial review um, and an effective remedy in domestic law against the original decision. And of course, would take a vast amount of time. Um, and the, the uh, other point was that the Article 47 remedy, I should emphasise, is not just for fundamental rights. It is for all rights in the, conferred by the uh, European Union legislature. And that is why you see when you read Geselbash and Mengestab uh, talk about procedural rights, uh, rights in relation to time limits and so on and so forth. It's not just um, charter rights on, uh, on the right to family life and so on. Um, I think that. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, thank you. Um, Look, there are two points in reply on Article Twenty Seven, the interpretation. And then I'd like to respond to the point about um, whether judicial review is excluded by Article 27, whether it's narrow rights or not. So firstly, um, on the interpretation, and just responding to a point my learned friend made at the end of her submissions about the language of Article 27, we don't need to go back to it, we've looked at it repeatedly, but when you do go back to Dublin 3, it's relevant in my respectful submission that Articles 26 and 27 are not just in the same chapter of Dublin 3, they're in the same section of the same chapter of Dublin 3, that's Section 4, headed Procedural Safeguards, Indeed, they are the only, the only two provisions in there. And in my respectful submission, they've got to be read consistently with each other. So a transfer decision for the purposes of Article 26 has got to be the same as a transfer decision for the purposes of Article 27. And the learned friend accepts, I think, very realistically that a decision to refuse a take charge request cannot be a decision to transfer within the meaning of Article 26. And in my support on that submission, could I ask you to turn back to Mengestab at tab 13? It's in the Advocate General's opinion. And it's just past the section my learned friend relied upon about arbitrary, arbitrary distinctions. It's paragraph 107 on page 889. And you'll see how closely tied, the Advocate General says, Articles 26 and 27 are. Picking it up three lines down from letter D, in the absence of the notification requirements in Article 26.1, Article 
would be unable to fulfil those functions. I entirely accept, I think it's common ground and uncontroversial, that the approach to construction, if you look at the language, the context and the purpose, I say that the language and the context are clearly in my favour. That's leading to one side the repeated um, statement of principle by the CJEU, that um, Article 27 only applies, and I took you to them yesterday, where there's been an acceptance by the other state, so effectively where there is a transfer. The key point that's taken against me isn't based really on the language or the context of the regulation. It's based on point about there being an arbitrary distinction and that it said our interpretation would mean that um, the reliance on articles 8, 9, 10 and 11, which are the family unity provisions, wouldn't give rise to a right to an effective remedy under Article 27, whereas Articles 12 and 14, and those are the provisions for responsibility to be allocated on the basis of entry, the issue of a visa, residence in another state, would give rise to a, a right to an effective remedy. And you'll recall that this was the point that the upper tribunal regarded as decisive, and it's the key point upon which my learned friend relied in her submissions as well, particularly yesterday. But as I said in my submissions yesterday, the key distinction isn't between the criteria, it's not between Articles 8 to 11 and 12 to 14, the key distinction is whether there's a transfer or not. And a person, or a transfer decision, a person who objects to transfer can rely on any of the criteria, the family unity provisions and the other provisions. And I wonder if it would help if I gave you an example, just to see how it would work in practice, or how it does work in practice. We put the situation where an applicant arrives in France from Italy, having entered the EU on a visa issued by the Italians, so that would engage Article 12 a non-family unity provision. She arrives in Germany, uh, sorry, she arrives in France, my example. She arrives in France and she says to the French authorities, my partner or my husband is here in France. You are responsible under the family unity provisions. And in those circumstances, it would be Article 10. If France says, well, we don't believe you, we don't believe the relationship's a genuine one, and makes a take charge request to the Italians saying you are responsible under Article 12 and we want to transfer and the Italians accept, that applicant will have indisputably a right to challenge the transfer decision under Article 27. And she'll do that relying on the family unity provisions which are higher up the hierarchy. Her argument will be, it may be true that under Article 12, I would be Italy's responsibility because they issued the visa, but I am relying on Article 10, which is further up the hierarchy, my family unity rights, in short. And the French authorities would have to, French courts or tribunals, would have to consider that 
and give an effective remedy if they upheld her challenge. There's a challenge in reliance on the family unity provisions. So, in that example, um, has France uh, made a transfer decision? Yes. So, 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 so basically they say we're transferring, you. They, they make a request to Italy. And Italy says yes, we'll accept, and then yes. they make the transfer. Yes, France makes sorry, sorry if I, yes, that wasn't clear. France makes the transfer decision, and she so challenges it. And she challenges she, 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 there is a transfer decision. Yes. Yes. So where there's a transfer decision, you can rely on the family unity provisions. What you can't do is rely on any of the provisions. It's not arbitrary to seek to resist a transfer. So in it, may, it may be said that your example actually indicates to show the illogicality of it. Where, where, where you can in one circumstance, it, it, it might be said it's an odd policy situation where you can rely upon the family unity provisions in one case where, because of the factual situation, there, has to be, there is a transfer decision, but you can't in another situation where there isn't where actually the policy issue is exactly the same, which is actually uh, are the family being united in the same place? And it might be said, well, that, that, I'm not saying that's the, uh, that's the arbitrary argument. I'm simply making a different point, which right. is yeah. it may be said, well, that's a very odd policy. It, it is a different point, and I don't think I can say more than I said yesterday to address it. Of course, if you look at um, Article 8, for example, I mean, this may be part of the answer, that splitting up a family, removing somebody from their family members, is an interference. Okay. So at the moment you remove, you have breached the rights, unless it's lawful and proportionate. Whereas, as my Lord Lord Justice Hickenbottom pointed out in discussion yesterday, um, allowing entry in order for people to join up together is not a one-act interference, circumstances are more limited and a longer period of time is allowed. So once you've transferred, you have breached if it wasn't lawful and proportionate. It's not quite the same for admission cases. So in my example, if the applicant had never got as far as France where her husband was living, so she, she enters Italy on the basis of the visa, <coughs> she claims asylum there. But she says to the Italian authorities, I want admittance to France because that's where my husband is make a take charge, take charge request, and again, the French authorities say we don't accept this as a genuine relationship. She wouldn't have the right to a remedy against French refusal. She couldn't insist on a positive transfer, if that makes sense. So she had the right of an effective remedy against an interference, but Dublin doesn't confer a right to re require a transfer, to require admission to another state. Um, I, I she was a, uh, in one situation, she's got to France, and because the French don't accept what she says, she can challenge the transfer decision under, under 27. They can't remove her without giving her a right of challenge, yes. So, yeah, well, they make a transfer decision, and she challenges it under, in France under 27. In the next case, she doesn't get to France because they rebuff her at the border. She can't get there. So she's stuck in Italy. And she says, uh, I want to be transferred to France, that's where my husband is. Request is made, and uh, France says, no. I'm not quite sure what you're saying, her remedy is there. Well, she doesn't have a remedy under Dublin. Dublin doesn't give what, her what a remedy. remedy she have? What, what, is yeah. her, what is her remedy? Her remedy is the ordinary remedies that states have to comply with Article 8 or Article 7 of the Charter. So we're looking at the situation, that's why we looked at RSM and ZT, but where your human rights require, we're really looking at Article 8, where Article 8 requires, you go outside Dublin. But that's going to be in a rare but that, but case. That, but sorry, I, th I thought, I thought that... Dublin first. I'm, so sorry. I'm sorry, my Lord. My fault, I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. But I thought you were saying that that's the situation where you can only apply very compelling exception and so on. Um, to bypass Dublin, yes, that's right. You, yeah. So, I thought I was going to say, yeah. so, so, the, so her remedy in that case, because she's been rebuffed at the border and she has to stay in Italy, she would have a remedy, I think you're saying, against France under Article 8 if she could show exceptional circumstances, very compelling and so on. No, that's not 
that's domestic law, my lord. That's, that's our test. I'm not sure the test in France would be the same way, but she's got to make an application to the French and challenge that relying upon her Article 8 rights. Um, but it's nothing to do with Dublin. That's not what Dublin provides. I'm mean, like just trying to see what her rights are. Yeah. Well, I mean, is it sufficient to say whatever short rights she may have? I mean, she may have no rights in France. I don't But she can make an application for asylum in Italy. And then, and, and then she's into Dublin three. Yes. That's what she should do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But, yes. What, but if she asks, what if are I, her rights? What, what she, an equivalent of a judicial review based on Article eighteen in Italy? That's what it would be. Would it? Well, it'll be whatever their domestic remedies are. Well, I'm just to saying that we don't know. I mean, you're, no. presupposing there's a, you're presupposing there's a right there. There's no. We know there's no. Your case is there's no right under Article Article twenty seven. Yes. So her rights are whatever may be available in Italy. Yes, but which Italy's we don't got know an about. obligation to act compatibly with Article 8. It doesn't have to, to only have the, yeah, Dublin 3. Um, I, I think my Lord of Justice, you can put it more articulately, definitely, than I did yesterday. But, but it's... It, I don't understand. But, 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 but if, in the unlikely event that the law in Italy is, that the, the remedies, the rights and remedies in Italy domestically are the same as here, uh, she would not get any outside Dublin 3 because her, her remedy is to apply for asylum. You can't go around um, Dublin 3, said Lord Justice Beats. You've got to apply for Dublin 3 and then you're in, in the system. Well, yes, ex except in a... Com yeah. except, except in this tiny yes. category, correct. Yeah. If, 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 you are look yeah, if you are looking at wanting an immediate transfer. But all your other remedies, somebody, let's just say, for example, who's nothing to do with asylum or protection, but somebody who's living in India or who wants to come and join a family member here makes an application. Dublin 3 isn't going to help them. Dublin 3 is not about <laughs> um, getting people to join their spouses. It's about the short procedural stage of where should an asylum claim be determined. Yeah. And that's why the courts have said you use the Dublin 3 procedures except in a compelling case. If you've got general grounds for family reunification, you make an application for entry clearance. But there, the, the, you don't look at Dublin 3 in isolation, which is part of an entire scheme of immigration legislation which honours Article 8. I mean, it, 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 it's a bit... I'm a, I, any analogy I raise is not normally falls apart in, in my hand before I finish the sentence, but it's, a, it, it's similar, isn't it, to the domestic position. If, as you say, somebody is in India and they want to come here because they've got family members, they don't simply say Article 8. They say immigration rules, yes. and they, yes. they may or may not satisfy yeah. the rules. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and there may possibly, but very unlikely, uh, be a residual Article 8 thing, but, I mean, it's, yes. it's jolly unlikely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, the, it's the same yes. sort of yes. scheme. Yes, it is. It well, is exactly no, I, that. I was trying to make a slightly different point, which I was trying to contrast the position under Dublin 3, according to whether on the facts the, the, this particular lady happened to get to France or not. Yeah. And the result of... It's the same issue, which is she wants to be reunited with her husband, who she says yes. is her husband. Yes. For all our point, I was making nothing about India... Uh, to be frank, uh, I was just trying to make the point that on your interpretation, which may be correct, uh, there's a very different procedural situation according to the happenstance, if I may call it that, of whether she happens to get into France or not. That's all the point I was making. Well, it's patently a good point. Yes, there is a difference in procedure, um, but... but that's the way the Dublin regulation works. If that's we're right, and that's the consequence of what yeah. you say. Now, that, and the, the question one has to what word one has to understand is: well, is that is that is that is that a logical or likely policy decision or not? Your answer to that is: well, the wording is clear, the context is clear. That's how it is. Yes. I mean, that's your answer. It is my answer. Well, I understand that. I don't think help. I don't think com comparing this with somebody coming from India is very helpful. Well, I. I so, I may be wrong. <laughs> so, those were my points on, on Article 12, 27 and the interpretation. Yes. Um, could I deal with, then, um, 
the point that's put against me that all of this is irrelevant because judicial review would lie in any event and Article 27 couldn't possibly have intended to narrow the scope of that. This isn't a point that was debated before the tribunal, because the tribunal simply proceeded on the basis that Article 27 applied, and there was no suggestion that it shouldn't have granted, permission shouldn't have been granted, and judicial review shouldn't have been pursued. So I am I'm not going to ask you to make a decision on the, the, um, the scope and the ambit of judicial review in a Dublin 3 case. All I'm going to say is that whether or not Article 27 applies will plainly be relevant and something the tribunal will want to consider in its approach to judicial review. And it's wrong to say that as a matter of principle, the interpretation of Article 27 can't make any difference to the tribunal's judicial review discretion, the exercise of that discretion. When, when you say that um, uh, Article 27 cannot have been intended to have narrowed the scope of that do you, uh, judicial review. Do you mean rights or remedies? Um, Article 27 is headed remedies. This is, we, yeah. we, we, we've got, as it were, to unlawfulness yeah. by, by the time we, we it, it, literally yeah. in the judgment. Uh, and then we go on to remedies. And, yeah. and it, it's, it, it, it's mainly concerned with Article 27, al although they do refer to domestic cases outside Article 27. Yes. Um, could I suggest that the most helpful starting point may be what was the position before Dublin 3? So before Dublin 3, the courts would very, very rarely entertain a judicial review challenge to any sort of decision under the Dublin regime, it was Dublin 2 at the time. That was on the basis that it was intended as an interstate mechanism. And it wasn't intended to confer additional rights on individual applicants. And so the court would only intervene where, in rare situations such as, remember we were discussing this yesterday, where, for example, somebody was um, being threatened with transfer to a country that didn't respect human rights, then they could rely on Article 3. That was a position before Dublin 3. Dublin 3 indisputably conferred greater procedural rights on applicants. And my learned friend rightly described it as a hybrid because in some respects it's interstate and in others it confers rights on individuals. It, it does both things. It does both it, things. It sets out a mechanism for interstate sorting yes. out who's going to be responsible. Yeah. Uh, but it also now um, gives individuals rights. It does, yes, it does. And it's the extent of those rights that's important. Article 27 plainly gives greater rights of individual challenge than was the case under Dublin 2. In Geselbash, the court explained what the rights and mechanisms conferred by Dublin 3 were, the developments as a result of the adoption of Dublin 3. And if we turn back to Geselbash at tab 12, page 4002, the developments that take place as a result of the adoption of Dublin 3. So the 
first development is that the EU legislature has introduced or enhanced various rights and mechanisms guaranteeing the involvement of asylum seekers in the process of determination. Um, then it refers to Abdullahi, and that was the case about not um, being transferred to a state that wouldn't respect your rights under Article 3, for example. Then it goes through those, the new procedural rights. At 47, paragraph 47, Article 4, a right to be informed of various criteria. And I, I'll ask you to read it all because I just summarise it fairly quickly. I'm conscious of the time. 48, interview rights. 49, procedural safeguards. Sets out at considerable length the arrangements for the notification of transfer decisions and the rules. And at 50, the right to an effective remedy, legal assistance, etc. Including at paragraph 51. So that is the scope of the greater procedural protection. If an individual, the remedy they're seeking does not fall within that, if it doesn't fall within Article 27, the tribunal is going to want to consider carefully what approach it should adopt in entertaining judicial review applications. My learned friend said very correctly, but this is quite a new phenomenon. It's only really since ZT Syria, so that's the 2016 decision that there's been an increase in the volume of date charge requests and the beginning of this upsurge of litigation in the Upper Tribunal. And the Upper Tribunal has granted permission to appeal on the meaning of Article 27. It's a specialist tribunal and it's asked for this court's assistance. There is no reasoned approach to what the implications of that will be for its function. That will be need, need to be considered in another case if you agree with us that Article 27 doesn't apply. But it's plainly capable of having a bearing. And the tribunal will need to consider to what extent entertaining judicial review proceedings in this jurisdiction, where an individual claimant is in another member state and is going through the procedures there, to what extent that involves bypassing the Dublin processes? Well, there must be cases where the upper tribunal can act. Uh, for example, if um, a decision is made in relation to entirely the wrong person. I think I said at the beginning yesterday, I'm not suggesting that judicial review is completely excluded. No, I absolutely accept that. And what I'm saying is it'll have so to why consider that. It be a normal um, judicial review criteria read in the light of Dublin 3. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I followed that. Which, why shouldn't what be an, uh, a normal... You apply normal uh, judicial review criteria, but in the light of Dublin 3. Because what you're challenging is a decision that is taken under Dublin 3, where, um, where Dublin 3 does not confer procedural rights on the individual. So I don't want to argue it here, because all I'm saying is it's something that is plainly capable of having an impact on the way judicial review is exercised in the upper tribunal and it's not being considered by the tribunal yet and they will need to consider it at some point unless I'm wrong and we're in Article 27 territory. Well, this, uh, I just, this, is a, this is important that it, we understand exactly what this is. Does, does this relate to the matters on which we were um, asking and this all my questions at the beginning about what is the scope of judicial review uh, in this case uh, uh, in relation to the matters that have not been appealed, couldn't be appealed. So uh, it's very important we understand this. I think 
I, I can only speak for myself, I think that I was left with the impression at the end of your submissions uh, yesterday that um, uh, really judicial review was only available when linked with Article 8, which it invariably would have to be. Um, when, you're, when, when you're in the situation we're in now, which is a refusal, not within, as you say, a refusal to accept a request to take charge, not within Article 27, and it would only be permissible in the exceptional cases that we talked about, very compelling, exceptional circumstances, so which is a high peak. That's where I was left, yes. uh, with, as I understood your submissions. What opened up yesterday, and has continued today, from Ms Kilroy's position, is to say, well, that's not correct. And we're being asked, I think now, if you're maintaining your position, I think we're being asked a view about this. She says it's not open to us, it's not part of the issues. But where there seems to be a divide now is she saying, well, you know, even if you're not within Article 27 in a refusal to take charge, a refusal to accept a request to take charge, even if you're not, you still have available to you as there was in this case, and was accepted in this case by the tribunal, against which there's no appeal, you still have the right to say your, your decision-making is challengeable and unlawful because you didn't, flow, you didn't comply with uh, ordinary requirements of public authority linked to your Article 8 obligations, which underlies the whole of Dublin 3. So uh, what, I, what I really need to understand is, are you still divided on that issue or not? No, we are divided on that issue. We are issue. divided on that issue. But the issue arises as a positive point advanced by my learned friend in her skeleton argument in response to our interpretation of Article 27, which is, it makes no difference, she says, because you ought to be saying Article 27 has no bearing, judicial review would exist in the same way anyway. And we're saying... That's not an issue before you. Article 27 is capable of having a bearing, and that should be sorted out before the tribunal in a case where it arises in, and, and where but before this you, court when permission to appeal is granted on that point. How can you advance point. that case when you lost before below on the challenge to unlawfulness? How can you? How is that open to you to raise that now? Because the the other tribunal decided against you on that point. Yes. I'm not raising it. I'm inviting you not to determine the point that my learned friend asks you to determine, which is that judicial review would lie in any event. So the interpretation of Article 27 makes no difference. It's her positive case in answer to, to my arguments on ground one. Ground one is quite simple. The ground on which permission to appeal was granted is quite simple. So does Article 27 apply? What's the scope of Article 27? There is no ground before your court as to. And if it doesn't, what effect does that have on the tribunal? That's a huge question. So the starting point... How, how, how would that arise? I mean, uh, um, a, a, a respondent can raise an additional can either cross appeal or whether an appeal in their favour can ask for the... the, the, the uh, decision to be upheld on additional grounds. But that's not required here because she says, well, they've decided the point, and I agree with the point, which is, yes, you know, um, there, was a law, there, was a, there was a challenge to lawfulness on the basis of ordinary JR principles combined with Article 8, and they decided that. So how would, how would that point have been, raised, have been brought before the court on a successful point? But they didn't decide the point and what the implications would be if Article 27 didn't apply because it wasn't argued. But, uh, I, I understand that point. But are, are, are you saying that uh, this is either so or at least arguable, um, that because um, before Article 27, before Dublin 3, um, th there was no right to judicial judicially review uh, any of these Dublin decisions because there's no right to a remedy and the only right to a remedy now is under Article 27 and so it's either Article 27 or nothing so the premise upon which the submission has been made um, uh, which is that you can still go by way of as it were domestic judicial review 
is not a good premise, or at least is arguably yes. not a good premise. Yes. Um, but yes. you don't want, as it were, us to determine anything on that because it wasn't argued below, because below was only argued on the basis of Article 27. So that yes. was very long. Yeah, and it's our fault in a way that it wasn't argued. It wasn't, it wasn't, there was no challenge to the, I do see, in defence of those acting for the Secretary of State, the tribunal recorded that the arguments had evolved as the proceedings evolved. And and I didn't appear, and it's it's not a, an obvious point. First, the first step in the analysis is does Article 27 apply or not? But it, it, exactly as my Lord said, it, it is at least arguably wrong to say it has no impact on the scope of judicial review. And what I think would be really undesirable is for this court to say, in the absence of full argument, even if Article 27 doesn't apply, it makes absolutely no difference because the court ought to be, the tribunal should be entertaining judicial reviews irrespective of the procedural rights under W3. But, but, it, but it, if all of that is right, and it, it, it may be, um, Ms Kilroy's submissions, it seems to me, at least might be right. Uh, and, and doesn't, speaking entirely for myself, doesn't that make the, the whole of this... Um, appeal which is focused on Article 27, which may or may not have any great bearing in this jurisdiction because of the um, uh, possible availability of domestic remedies, um, uh, a, a, a dubious benefit to anybody. Well, coming from that direction, that's right, but uh, I'll, I'll just go back to what I said, that the first step in the analysis has got to be, does Article 27 apply? Because if it if it, if it does, if the tri what the tribunal's doing is giving effect to a remedy conferred by Dublin Three, there's no dispute about it, and that's what the, tri you know, the tri tribunal yeah, found I it see. was. <laughs> and, and the tribunal have given permission to appeal on that important and quite difficult issue of principle, does Article 27 apply or not? So what we'd ask the court to do is, is just decide that point. Can I go back to this uh, issue about... Um whether it's open to us to, uh, to, to reach a judgment on this question of what, what happens if Article 27 doesn't apply to judicial review. Um, is, is your point, just so I really chased it down, is your point that because you never argued below that there couldn't be judicial review unless you were within 27, that therefore the point has never arisen at any stage until now. Yes. Is, is that what you're saying? You didn't advance the point. No. But does it make any difference that in the judgment as we've seen, and I think in the points of claim, but I haven't really looked at them, but in the judgment, the Article 27 point only arises at the point of your ground two. In other words, as I understand it, in the judgment itself, the upper tribunal, uh, in discussing the lawfulness or otherwise uh, of uh, the Secretary of State's conduct in relation to this matter, you, I, I think I might be saying Article 22 doesn't feature. It's only once they've decided that they were unlawful, then the question of how wide is the remedy under 27. Does that make any difference? Yeah. Yes. In relation to Ground 2, it's quite important to remember that Ground 2 is formulated on the basis that we are wrong on Article 27. It only arises if we're wrong. And what I'm accepting, what I accepted yesterday, was that if we're wrong, an Article 27 applies. So, to put that another way, it, your concession yesterday um, was only in relation to Article 27. If Article 27 applies, we're in Article 27, and it's informed by Article 8, in the light of Balajigari, tribunal, it's very difficult to criticise their reasoning, and I wouldn't seek to do so. Quite different if Article 27 doesn't apply, uh, yeah, doesn't apply, as we say. You need to look at the, in, the, the, the way the tribunal approaches its judicial review jurisdiction is likely to be much more limited, and they will have to decide, that they are, their starting point, they will have to be, we are not in Article 27 territory. In, in their discussion of article tw of remedies, which is Article 27 focused for sure, um, they, they do refer to cases which are not Article 27 cases, cases uh, which are all precedent fact cases in, in our own domestic judicial review. That's that's so, isn't it? 
Oh yes, but we're not in precedent fact territory here. I mean, we've played the art. <laughs> um, it's not a precedent fact case. I mean, it might be a binary question. Are they related or not? That's not the same as precedent fact, as the Lord knows. So, so, so you say that the, the tribunal, anyway, uh, in terms of remedies, was solely focused on Article 27? Uh, no, but I'm saying it probably should have been, <laughs> because... I'm so sorry, we've gone back, if I could have maybe three or four more minutes. One of the reasons why it's important to look at the scheme of Dublin is that where you have a, um, a transfer decision and you've got a right of effective remedy, that's all considered within the Dublin processes. The process is suspended and there's detailed provision for how the Dublin process continues whilst accommodating the challenge. There is none of that for a challenge to a take charge request. And I don't know if you could, maybe the significance may be more apparent now. My submission yesterday, I was making the point that as far as France is concerned, the procedure has ended. The take charge request may be, uh, the re refusal of the take charge request may be under challenge domestically. It wasn't quashed until a year after it had been transmitted. France's obligations continue to run. It's received a refusal. And that's why it's important that it's hybrid, it's interstate, as well as being just between the UK and the individual, because France has got its own responsibilities. And so the Dublin procedure is closed as far as France is concerned. Well, I don't accept that. Uh, in practice, that is not what happens. So. Um, <laughs> well, look at the regulation and try and find, and you've not been taken to any provision that, that stops the clock or suspends the procedure following the rejection of a take charge request. And that's what you remember I took you to Article 29 and the suspension provisions yesterday. They, they're all directed, 27 suspension and 29, um, it's all di directed to what happens when a, a transfer doesn't go ahead. I, I, I think we I'm so sorry. Can I ask you over the short adjournment, because we're, uh, it's quite important to us, just to um, prepare in writing for us the extent of your concession on, on ground two? Yes. Right? Because I'm now left in a state of uncertainty as to what it was. I thought, and I'm sure it's entirely my fault. I thought when you finished yesterday that you had accepted that on ordinary judicial review bases, provided that the um, upper tribunal was aware, which is made aware generally, that you're not compelled to decide issues of fact on judicial review, it was open for them to do so in the circumstances. I thought that was irrespective of Article 27. As I understand what you're saying now, you're saying that concession was only on the hypothesis that Article 27 applies and you will not make any concession if it doesn't apply. The ground is only on if we are wrong. That's what the ground is before the court. If we're wrong and Article 27 does apply, what's the approach to fact-finding? So I can see there's no error in that respect. I don't really want to go beyond the ground of appeal because... The, well, can you just uh, put course, it down? Because yes. I think it's really important we don't yeah. misrepresent what you say no. at any stage. So um, I think we've got be to... I don't know where we're going to get to at, uh, at 5 but I, 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 I don't want you to feel that you haven't made the points you want to make. I'm not Thank encouraging you. you to make more, but it, you know, it's quite an important, quite a difficult issue. I, I mean, we've seen a number of different ways of putting the appeal and uh, responding to it. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll have a chance to think further about what information we need to further measure the health that we need. I'll try and reduce that to writing. Subject to any questions from the court, I don't think I need to take very much of your time at two o'clock, but I'd be really grateful if there's anything where, there be a number of matters where my submissions haven't been as clear as you would have wished, or you've got further questions for me. It's, it's quite difficult. Thank you. I pass two.